Hello and welcome to this month's webinar, Pricing Research Techniques. I'm Miklos Kremzer, Marketing Director here at Sawtooth Software. Anyone familiar with Sawtooth Software would also be familiar with today's presenter, Brian Orm. Brian is the President and CEO of Sawtooth Software, and he has been with the company for 27 years. And if you have read through our documentation or attended any of our conferences, you're probably familiar with his work. Brian has an extensive experience using advanced methods such as choice-based conjoint for pricing research, uh, namely pricing optimization. He is the author of several books and several publications. Brian is also the lead organizer of the annual Analytics and Insights Summit, which is one of the largest conferences in the space of practical data science and choice-based market research. This year's Analytics and Insights Summit will take place in Barcelona, Spain in May. So if you're tired of the winter, we'd love to see you in Spain. This webinar will be 45 to 50 minutes long, uh, along with my colleagues, Christina Miller, Aaron Hill, and Keith Sean. I will be monitoring the Q&A. During the webinar, please use the Q&A window to ask questions, which will be answered at the end of the presentation. Uh, there's a Q&A uh, uh, button, and there's also a chat button. Please use the Q&A if you have questions. Um, we'll also be sending out a link to the recording uh, for everyone when we're done, and they will be available on Sawtooth Software's website, sawtoothsoftware.com, usually within 24 hours. We will email all the attendees under uh, after the web the recording is available. Okay. And with that, I'd like to uh, uh, turn the time over to Brian Orm. Thank you, Miklos. Thank you for joining us to talk about comparing different survey-based pricing research methods. First, a quick intro to Sawtooth Software. We're celebrating our 40th year in business. We focus on education, such as webinars like this, workshops and conferences, such as the Analytics and Insights Summit coming up in Barcelona the first week. In, in May. And we also have do-it-yourself platforms. We have a new web-based cloud platform called Discover and our older and more complete Lighthouse Studio platform that perhaps many of you on this talk have used. Those survey platforms can be used for general surveys, for conjoint analysis and max diff. Sati Software is generally known for fielding conjoint analysis and max diff surveys, but a lot of our customers are using just the general survey capabilities within Sati Software to do research studies like the ones we're gonna be talking about today. All of the types of survey-based pricing research methods that we'll be discussing can be done in Sawtooth Software's general survey tool, or of course, with Sawtooth Software's conjoint analysis tools. We also have a very capable consulting division led by Keith Shun. So why would we want to use surveys to study pricing and price sensitivity? Well, often analyzing existing sales data or doing in-market pricing experiments is just not feasible in your space. Maybe you have a new to the world product that has not yet been introduced, or maybe you're considering modifications to existing products, including perhaps setting a new price outside the range of experience so far. In these cases, of course, you'd need to approach it with a survey-based approach rather than real-world data. So we're gonna talk about four common survey-based pricing methods that are used today. One, the Monadic Price Experiment. Two, Gabber Granger. Three, Van Westendorp Price Sensitivity Meter. And number four, Conjoint Analysis, CBC, Choice Based Conjoint, which is also known as DCE or Discrete Choice Experiments. Of course, you could also just ask respondents how much they'd expect to pay for your product, but this has some obvious weaknesses. It invites lowballing and it can be very problematic. And for that reason, rather than just saying, hey, how much would you expect to pay for this product? One of these four methods, which are more sophisticated and work better, are often used. First up, let's talk about the monadic price experiment. Fancy name, but all it means is we're randomly splitting respondents into different groups, perhaps three or four or five different groups. And these are called experimental cells. 
we randomly split respondents into those different groups, hopefully using some matched quotas before. So we send in the same composition of people into each of these random splits of our sample. And after we've collected the data, it's important to apply respondent weighting to match the respondents on their characteristics that you think may be correlated with price sensitivity. Now then, we've randomly broken respondents into different groups of respondents, and we'll show them different questions. Well, it's the same question, but we're going to vary the price across the different respondent groups. We'll introduce the product concept to all the respondents, and we'll show each group a different price and ask a standard, typically five-point purchase intent scale, which I'm going to show in a moment. After we've collected the data and done, done the weighting afterward, we compare the cells on purchase intent typically adjusted downward because typically respondents will overstate their purchase likelihood. Here's that standard five-point purchase intent scale that I mentioned. It typically runs from definitely would purchase to definitely would not purchase. And often, for example, in consumer packaged goods research, we deflate the five-point purchase intent scale by some multiplicative factors. For example, in consumer packaged goods, we might take 75% of the top box, the people who said definitely would purchase and say that they really would purchase, 25% of the second box, the probably would purchase box, and 10% of the middle box or the might or might not purchase box. Let me show an example of that. Let's imagine that we randomly broke respondents, split respondents into, let's say four different experimental cells. Each of those groups is gonna get a different question in our questionnaire. The only thing that's different about the question is the price that we're gonna show. Let's imagine for the first group of respondents, we showed a particular price and we got these responses over, let's say 400 respondents. 30% said that they definitely would purchase at that price, 25% probably would purchase and 30% might or might not, et cetera. All of those numbers add to 100%. Now the adjusted purchase intent is to take 75% of the top box or 75% of the 30% in the top box, 25% of the second box of the 25%, and 10% of the third box. And those all added together come up with an adjusted purchase intent of just a tiny bit over 30%. We do that for each of our groups of respondents who are randomly split into cells where each cell saw a different price. Then we plot the purchase intent, that adjusted purchase intent across the different cells. So in this situation, let's imagine that we split respondents into four different groups randomly. And the first group saw $25, the second saw $35, the third saw $45, and the fourth saw $55. And we might get a very nice curve like this if we're lucky. And we'll talk a little bit more about how to get a little luckier later. What we can do beyond just looking at the purchase intent pseudo demand curve is to multiply multiply the purchase intent by the price at each of the four price points to, to plot a relative revenue curve. Excuse me. What researchers often like to do is look for the revenue maximization price. And here we see that it's <clears throat> at $35. Looks like my voice is going to go, so we'll try our best. It's better to bring a competitive context into our magnetic experiments. <clears throat> For example, you could show, instead of just a single product on the screen, you could show your products, your product at the X price. And of course, the X price varies depending upon which respondent cell you're in. You might be seeing $25 or $35 or $45, but you can show fixed competitors in there that don't vary across the experimental cells. And you can include a none. I wouldn't buy any of these response. This looks very much like a regular CBC type study, a regular conjoint study, but it is within the context of a monadic experiment. Better yet, we would recommend a dual response question with purchase intent in your monadic experiments. 
a question to first ask people, if, this, if these were your only choices, which would you choose? Competitor one, your product at the experimental price chosen for whichever cell that the respondent is selected into, and a competitor two. And then given what you know about the market and your budget, how likely would you be to purchase the option that you chose above? Again, on the five-point scale, which we're going to apply the, um, the adjustments to adjust the purchase intent. So some advantages from magnetic price experiments is it's very quick for respondents to answer, typically 45 seconds or less. And it's a pure scientific experiment. It's an across subjects experiment where the only thing that varies about prices typically is um, done across respondents. Each respondent only sees their experimental price, whether it was 25 or 35 or $45, et cetera. Unless, of course, you do a sequential monadic experiment and ask respondents to answer the question multiple times for multiple prices. And I'll mention that more in a moment. Now, if you show competitors alongside your test product for to establish a competitive context, it very much resembles the strong and trusted conjoint analysis CBC approach. But it's made much easier because we're typically only showing respondents just one scenario. And so in a limited way, it just focuses on the firm's price sensitivity because that's the only thing we're varying is the firm's price. And so that's the only aspect of the experiment. So it's not quite as complete as the more powerful CBC approach that we'll be discussing at the end of this webinar. Now then, there are some problems with the monadic pricing experiments. Sample size requirements tend to be big. We tend to be able to stabilize the results, want to have about 300 to 500 respondents per exper experimental cell. So if we had four experimental cells, like I've been showing, that would be, uh, for example, 1,200 to 2,000 respondents. Now, to deal with these um, big sample size requirements, sometimes researchers decide to show respondents a random, let's say, three out of seven total prices if we were, we're going to have a seven-cell experiment for a sequential monadic experiment. Now, when you do that, now respondents can see that it really is a pricing game. <clears throat> I mean, not only are we just focusing on price, but we're asking about multiple price points, which may invite uh, a little bit of overstatement of price sensitivity, a little bit of uh, artificiality or bias to our price sensitivity measurement because it's very clearly just a pricing experiment and only price is changing. Another weakness with the monadic pricing experiment is usually you're just looking at a single or very few product concepts to test. Um, typically, it's just one product concept. You're testing the price sensitivity of that, which makes it much less powerful than other techniques, such as conjoint analysis, which can look at uh, dozens or hundreds of variations of your product concept and the price sensitivity for each. Now, with the monadic pricing experiment, if you just ask respondents about purchase intent for a product without showing any competitive context. You just show the product and say, how likely would you be to buy it? And you can't tell what the competitors are priced at or given any other reference points. It often will understate price sensitivity. And therefore we recommend if using monadic pricing experiments that you make it look very similar to like a conjoint, a CBC question, and that you do the dual response where you ask people which of the product concepts they'd be most likely to buy and the likelihood that they would buy it. One of the challenges we've mentioned with the monadic pricing experiment is the um, potentially real possibility that you're gonna see price reversals across your experimental cells. Here we have four experimental cells from low price to high price and the uh, price function, the demand curve, isn't this nice monotonically decreasing function like we'd expect. We actually see some jig jags and some uh, reversals. Uh, this is uh, disheartening <laughs> for sure when you do these types of experiments. So to avoid this, uh, recommend four things, ample sample size. Number two, that you balance the sample with upfront quotas so that you've got uh, a similar composition of respondents going into each of the four random splits in this case. 
and that afterwards that you weight the respondent data to get a weighted purchase intent by significant demographics or usage variables or attitudinal variables that correlate strongly, that you think might correlate strongly with people's uh, purchase intent and also their price sensitivity. Number three, that you measure price points in a monadic experiment that are at least 10% apart from one another. And four, that you show a competitive context with uh, in the monadic experiment so that respondents have appropriate reference. Then, number two on our agenda, let's talk about Gabbard Granger. And of course, at the end, I'm going to summarize the strengths and weaknesses and give some recommendations. Regarding Gabbard Granger technique, proposed in the 1960s. It's, it's a survey-based questionnaire that asks respondents if they would buy a product at each of many price points to find the highest price that each respondent would be willing to pay. The starting price, and you start with a list of prices such as 20, 30, 40, $45, $50. You, you randomize which price that you ask respondents about first. You show them that random price and you ask them if they're willing to pay to, to pay that price, to buy the product at that price. If they say no, then you randomly pick a lower price from your list and ask it again. If they say yes, then you randomly pick a higher price and ask it again until you figure out which price point on your list is the highest price that they'd be willing to pay. Let me give an example. Let's imagine that the price list that we're using runs from $20 to $50 in $5 increments. Let's randomly select for each respondent $25. Let's imagine respondent one, we randomly select $25 and we ask them if they'd buy it at that price. Respondent number one says, yes, I'd buy it at $25. Well, then we randomly pick a higher price. And let's imagine the randomly picked higher price is $40. This respondent happens to say, no, I wouldn't pay $40. So now we go backward again. We randomly pick a lower price between $25 and $40, and we randomly pick 30. The respondent says yes. And so then we got to raise the price again to the remaining one that we haven't looked at yet, which is $35. And this respondent says no. So we've established through these series of steps with a random starting point that $30 is the highest price that this respondent would pay. Now, we can plot across respondents the percent of respondents who said that they would be willing to pay at each of the prices on our price list to get our demand curve. Now, the weakness, the weaknesses of this are that they it typically only focuses on one product concept at a time, so it's not as powerful and flexible as, for example, conjoint analysis. Number two, it doesn't put the respondent into the more realistic market mindset of comparing multiple alternatives and prices, much like a uh, like choice-based conjoint mimics the marketplace choices. And Gabbard Ranger is so obviously a pricing game to respondent. Anytime they say no, then you lower the price. Anytime you say yes, you raise the price in this, this sequence that seems to just test their resolve that many respondents just may adopt bargaining behavior or helping behavior. And the overall effect of Gabbard Granger may be to overstate price sensitivity because it's so clearly a pricing game that um, doesn't really mimic real world choices as well as other techniques that we're talking about today. However, it is quick and dirty. And it seems quantitative because we get a demand curve by plotting the percent of respondents who said yes at each of the price points in our experiment. Next, let's talk about the Van Westendorp price sensitivity meter. Proposed in 1976 by a Dutch economist, Van Westendorp, it, the basic version uses four simple questions. At what price would you consider this product a good value? And it's a purely open-ended question. Respondents uh, often are given just an open end. Uh, you can also do it with a list of uh, prices and ask them to select off that list. Although if you do so, you should use a very wide list of prices because price sensitivity model, the price sensitivity meter is, um, is more for evaluating uh, and investigating in, in a semi-qualitative, semi-quantitative way what prices really are people expecting? This, this is a technique that you would tend to use when you don't have a good feel 
for how respondents think about price in the marketplace, and there aren't really good um, substitutes for this product that exist. <clears throat> the second question is to ask the respondent, at what price is this product beginning to get expensive, but you'd still consider buying it? That's the acceptably expensive price. Number three, at what price would this product be so expensive that you'd never consider it? That's the too expensive price point. And number four, at what price would this product be so inexpensive that you would doubt its quality? That's called the too cheap price. And that too cheap price, um, potentially you can drop that because it, it is kind of a strange question to ask at what price it's so inexpensive that you doubt its quality. Although for some products that you might be studying, such as luxury automobiles or LASIK eye surgery or locks for bicycles, uh, you know, you might want to consider that uh, the product can be too expensive, inexpensive, that it would not be trusted. Anyway, you ask these four questions for each respondent. And if you can, it is better that you show respondents competitive products and pricing uh, to as context so that they can better establish uh, the, the context and give you more reliability on and, and uh, accuracy on their, uh, their, their price points that they're going to tell you. Now, the too cheap and the too expensive price points are optional. Uh, the actual wording of what you use can also vary. And in fact, a very quick and dirty approach that gets similar to the price sensitivity meter is just to ask one question. What price would you expect to pay for this product? What was suggested in the, in the first paper that Van Westendorp published on this is to do a line crossing type of analysis where we plot cumulative curves based on the four price points. Uh, let me explain what's going on here. Let's look at the red line, the too expensive line. If we look at $100, 10% of respondents said that $100 was too expensive. However, if we go clear to the top, $1,000, 90% of the respondents at that point said that the $1,000 is too expensive. So that's how we plot cumulative curves for these four price points. And Van Westendorp ascribed certain meaning to the four intersections of these four price of these four lines. He suggested that this intersection on the left between the purple and the blue lines was the point of marginal cheapness. He said that the intersection between the green and the red lines was the point of marginal expensiveness, and that that interval between those two points is the acceptable price range, or in this case, in this example, from $150 to $292. He also suggested names for these other two intersections, the optimal price point and the indifference price point. And, um, you know, frankly, it, it, there's just not a lot of empirical support or rigor behind this line crossing uh, type of analysis. It hasn't been rigorously tested against other forms of pricing research, although it's been cited dozens of times, if not hundreds of times in the literature. And some of the elements of the Van Westendorp approach, asking about the too cheap question, even just kind of conflict with standard economic theory for most products where, you know, the law of supply and demand kicks in and that the lower we uh, charge, the more the quantity demand it is. Number three, it's probably more a measurement of price expectations among your respondents than true price sensitivity. So again, if you are more at the qualitative phase and you just don't know what price should be charged for your product, uh, this might be a good uh, first stage qualitative experiment before you follow up with something a little bit stronger, such as a monadic, uh, monadic approach or a conjoint approach. With the PSM, maybe it's you know, just enough to identify a price range and to pretend that these intersections between these at, at those four points with technical sounding names mean something, but it it really isn't very rigorous, and we wouldn't wouldn't put a lot of trust or stock in those four price points, those four intersections between the price lines. We wouldn't really recommend that you use the original line crossing example um, analysis. Rather, we can do better with the Van Westendorp technique. 
uh, the Newton Miller Smith in 1993 recommended a very nice extension to the uh, price sensitivity meter that just involves asking two additional questions. Uh, purchase intent questions using the definitely would to definitely would not buy on the two middle points that the respondent gives you, the acceptably cheap and the acceptably expensive. So for the acceptably, after the respondent gives us the four answers to the four questions, we ask them follow-up questions about the two middle price points. Would you, how likely would you be to buy the product at those two middle price points? Now, again, we often deflate this five-point purchase intent scale uh, by factors. Um, you know, for example, in consumer packaged goods, we might use these factors. Hopefully, you have some experience in your particular product category such that you know the deflation factors that work better, that are more predictive and valid for your particular context. Uh, there are also a number of uh, consulting firms in, uh, in the world that have uh, collected data and emphasize that they have the ability to uh, adjust your five-point scale to be predictive of actual uh, later uh, purchases. So let's imagine that you have used Van Westendorp, the four questions. Uh, let's imagine the respondent Smith said that $100 is too cheap, $200 is too expensive, and that um, acceptably cheap is $130 and acceptably expensive, expensive is $175. The Newton Miller Smith extension asks the purchase intent for the two middle price points. And Smith says that she would definitely buy at her acceptably cheap price of $130. And she says that she might or might not buy at her acceptably expensive price point at $175. So we have six pieces of data from respondent Smith. Now, the original Newton Miller Smith extension suggested putting a demand curve to Smith's data like the following. Remember that she said that too cheap was $100 and too expensive was $200. Newton Miller Smith ex ex um, suggested that anything to the right or left of those two values, those two prices, would be a 0% likelihood of buying. That's a little bit strange, and we'll talk about that when it comes to the prices on the left, to assume that at $99, Smith just would not buy it at all. We'll talk about that in a potential remedy. But for the uh, acceptably cheap price, uh, with your uh, deflation factor to 75% on a definitely would purchase, we say that the demand curve for Smith says that at $130 that she is 75% likelihood of buying. And at the acceptably expensive price of $175, our adjustment factor says that uh, she is 10% likelihood to buy at that point. Okay, we do this for each respondent. And of course we have typically uh, dozens if not hundreds of respondents in the data set. So across all the respondents, we can average this demand curve to get the market-based demand curve, okay? And we just plot those. And that allows us for the market to be able to establish the purchase intention for each price point from the lowest price point that any respondent ever gave you to the highest price point that any respondent ever gave you in the Van Westendorp answers. And we can multiply the purchase intent by each price to shift to change that curve to be a relative revenue curve by price point to be able to investigate what would be the revenue maximization point if that's what uh, your goal is to maximize some, excuse me, averaged cross respondents. So we might get something like this. Uh, this would be across multiple respondents averaged the pseudo demand curve coming from the Van Westendorp with the Newton Miller Smith extension of the purchase likelihood questions. What's kind of strange is that again, Newton Miller Smith suggested that as the prices got too low that the purchase intent would fall, which really kind of flies in the face of standard uh, economic theory. Standard economic theory holds that people like to pay less to get products. And, um, and in today's world, for most market, for most products, um, they respond, Buyers would learn very quickly whether a price uh, that is really seems low still delivers a good value. They could look at uh, 
at reviews online. They could learn from other people in the marketplace that even though the price was lower than they expected, it still delivers good quality. And so why not buy it at the lower price? So we'll talk about uh, how we can put a different assumption on that in the next slide. But like we did before, we can multiply the purchase intent by the prices at each of these price points to change this into a relative revenue index curve. And in this case, we find that the revenue is maximized to the firm if we charge $400. Now, I've hinted at this a couple of times. The modified Newton Miller Smith that um, probably follows economic theory better is to not assume that people's purchase intent goes down to zero at the too cheap price that they said in the Van Westendorp four questions or lower than that, but rather to assume something probably more realistic that as we go cheaper than the acceptably cheap price, the second price point that the respondent gave us, that probably the purchase intent is gonna level off going to the left um, from that. And so we'd recommend that for most product uh, products in the marketplace as being a, a better economic assumption, but for some, uh, for example, luxury goods or LASIK eye surgery or locks for your bicycles, for example, maybe something a little bit more extreme, um, either all the way to the original Newton Miller Smith or somewhere in between there could be assumed. When you make this what we think is generally more reasonable assumption about the demand curve, that it doesn't tip back down at the lowest price points, we, it will lead to slightly lower recommended optimal prices compared to the original Newton Miller Smith extension of the Van Westendorp PSM. So, advantages of the Van Westendorp PSM is that it's quick for respondents to answer, probably about one minute or so for respondents to answer. And it can be very useful for new to the world products when you don't have a good feel for the appropriate price range and you're more doing upfront qualitative, semi-quantitative research to try to establish a, a, a price range that maybe you're going to use uh, to study later with something uh, more rigorous, such as a monadic price experiment or the choice-based conjoint. With the Newton Miller Smith extension, an advantage is that you can get a read of purchase intent across the price range, which hangs a little bit better economic theory onto the original uh, the, the original PSM technique as uh, suggested by Van Westendorp. Finally, I uh, would say that an advantage is that the sample size requirements are just not as large as other methods like choice-based conjoint or monadic price experiments. There's just not a lot of, because this is semi-qualitative, semi-quantitative, and we think of this technique more for uh, getting a read of the possible price ranges that you might want to explore later with a stronger method, there's just not a lot of need to spend, uh, you know, spend your money on thousands of respondents for this exploratory method. Uh, just use it to establish a price range to test later with stronger methods using smaller sample sizes, probably for the Van Westendorp technique. The weaknesses of the Van Westendorp technique are that it typically only focuses on one product at a time, uh, similar to the monadic pricing experiment or the Gabbard-Granger shares that weakness. And the traditional line crossing interpretation, if you only use the first uh, four data points, the first for uh, questions about acceptably cheap, too cheap, et cetera. Uh, it's that traditional line crossing interpretation is weak, as we've mentioned. But the Newton Miller Smith extension of asking the five point purchase likelihood question and the two middle price points allows you to plot um, an, economic, uh, an economic thing, which is a purchase intent by price, and allows us then to be able to tease out the uh, the optimization point for revenue. Another weakness of Van Westendorp is it just doesn't put respondents into a realistic market mindset of comparing multiple alternatives and prices. Now, you probably can dress up your Van Westendorp questions to be able to show respondents some uh, relevant prices for relevant alternatives in the marketplace to be able to give them just some sort of sense. Um, I mean, imagine if we were talking about a new pill on the marketplace that cures um, older people like myself of gray hair. 
Um, you know, they're, they're, that doesn't really exist in the marketplace that I'm aware of at this point. But maybe you could compare it to the price of dyeing your hair in a salon uh, over the over a year period versus uh, having a year's worth of pills. So try to give some sort of context into what uh, relevant competitors uh, or substitutes in the marketplace might um, price. So if if you can try, it'll help if you can put respondents into a realistic market mindset by having reference prices that are relevant. Otherwise, um, it just opens up the book to respondents to give you some a lot of uh, range of prices which might not be as tight as they should be. Would mention that Sawtooth Software has a nice Excel simulator that you can paste the answers to the six questions to and get these curves automatically calculated instantaneously for you. And you can go up to Sawtooth Software's website to download that. Um, this is a long uh, this this is a long URL address. So when you view the video afterwards, you can uh, type it down or you could just go to Sawtooth Software's website and in the search bar, just type Van Westendorp into the search bar at our website. And this should be one of the first couple of hits that comes up. Last on the agenda is to talk about conjoint analysis, also known as choice-based conjoint CBC or discrete choice experiments DCE. Here's a very simple example of a conjoint analysis question choice-based conjoint showing just two products at a time on the screen. Let's imagine that not only are you looking at price sensitivity, but you're also trying to optimize some of the features for your product and learn the willingness to pay for certain features. What's the willingness to pay, for example, for six-cylinder engine over four-cylinder engine for the Mustang and the Chevy Camaro? Respondents see multiple questions, but multiple things are varying typically more than just price. They can't tell it's just a pricing experiment because we're also varying the colors and the engine size and the make of the car, whether it's Chevy Camaro or Ford Mustang. So in this first question, this respondent sees a Chevy Camaro that's red six cylinder and $32,000 against a Ford Mustang that has different characteristics. In the next question, we change the characteristics. We use an experimental design that we essentially scramble the features in a balanced and fair experiment so that Chevy Camaro shows an equal number of times across questions and across respondents at each color, at each engine size, and each price. So in the second question, we've changed the Chevy Camaro's price and its color. And we've also changed the color and the price for the Ford Mustang. Now imagine respondents answering eight to 12 of those kinds of questions. Also imagine that um, we could extend this to not just force them to choose between Chevy and Ford, but to include a none option, which makes it more realistic because in the real world, people aren't forced to just to choose from two products. They could walk away and not choose either of these. And so typically a none alternative is included in choice-based conjoint studies. Often uh, a dual response none, as I talked about in the monadic experiment where we ask people to choose and then we ask them their purchase intent on a five point scale can be done with choice based conjoint. Now, the choice model, these data, it's a fair and balanced experiment. Chevy Camaro was shown an equal number of times at each color, at each engine size, and each price. And similarly, with the Ford Mustang. So we can statistically tease out across respondents and across choice tasks, which product features and prices were driving people's choices. The software will model it using a logistic regression that will compute preference scores or utilities for each attribute in our experiment, for each level of price for each. For for Ford versus Chevy, for red versus blue, et cetera, that predicts or explains what people were choosing. When we have that predictive model and those utility scores, this allows us to look at the consistency of respondents. We can identify and discard respondents who use who answer the questions seemingly randomly, which is a nice benefit of CBC compared to the other techniques. We can also predict using a market simulator 
And that simulator can be built in Excel, or that simulator can be a little bit more powerful using, for example, Sawtooth Software's commercial market simulator, either the web-based version or the desktop version. And we can, using that what-if simulator, predict what respondents would choose among thousands or millions of new product market scenarios. So this isn't just A-B testing. This is A to gazillion testing because we can be testing not only the product, its price sensitivity, but we can test whether we should um, issue that product in red or blue or with six cylinder or eight cylinder, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see how the choice-based conjoint is a much more flexible and complete model of people's choice for optimizing not only price, but optimizing the features at the prices for your, for your study. As I said, you, one of the greatest reasons that CDC is so widely used in the industry for product optimization and price optimization is the what-if market simulator that gets delivered often in an Excel formula, format. Imagine that this chart over here on the right are Excel cells and that I can, as a user of this Excel spreadsheet, I can change option one and two with little drop downs to specify whether it's Camaro, blue, six cylinder or whatever, and to change the prices. Every time I change one of these cells, the Excel spreadsheet refers behind the scenes to the utilities for each respondent and has each respondent vote for their preferred option by summing the utilities for these options and seeing which one is preferred. In this case, in this simulation, among these two options, 66% of the respondents prefer the Mustang at these features and at this price. So you can see how I could, for example, for Ford Mustang, put in a base case scenario with the color and how many cylinders that are in the engine, and I can vary the price holding Camaro constant and see how the percent share, the purchase intent or the uh, share of preference for the marketplace will change for the different price points, which allows me to plot a demand curve. For example, when I set the price at the low price, I might get 30% and at the high price, I might get a, a simulated share of preference or a simulated market share, if you will, of 10%. I hesitate to say market share because there's a lot more that goes into market share in the real world than the conjoint analysis simulator would take into account, such as uh, distribution of the product line, time on the marketplace, uh, the, the capabilities of the sales force, uh, any promotional offers, advertising, et cetera. Anyway, as we use the conjoint simulator to estimate the demand curve, we can also multiply the share of preference at each price point by the prices to get at the revenue maximization price through the relative revenue curve, just like we could with the other techniques that we've been talking about today. Now, I want to talk to you about how you can use the conjoint simulator to estimate willingness to pay, for example, for the uh, eight-cylinder engine versus the six-cylinder engine. Step one is to put in a is to have the the market simulator for your conjoint analysis study available to you, and for example in Excel, and you can simulate the shares of choice for your product versus competitive products in the none, and you write down your product simulated share at let's say its average middle price. Then what you do is that original product may have been the six cylinder version of your car. Now, holding all of the competitors constant, you now enhance your product, making it eight cylinders, which should improve the, uh, the share of preference. And you write down that new improved share of preference. Then, through a series of uh, trial and error, you find the increase in price for the eight-cylinder product that drives its share of preference back to the step one share when it was a six cylinder vehicle. That difference in price that leads to uh, the same share of preference for the improved product at a higher price is the willingness to pay for that product enhancement. Very powerful way to look at willingness to pay for conjoint analysis experiments. And note that we never asked respondents, how much are you willing to pay for an eight cylinder engine versus six? We 
show respondents more realistic scenarios, we observe their choices, and we tease out what must have been driving their preferences to result in the series of choices that we saw, which leads to our simulator, which allows us to statistically uh, analyze and figure out people's point indifference between having an eight-cylinder engine versus a six-cylinder engine. So you can see the power that the conjoint analysis simulator gives you. Now, the pros and the cons of conjoint analysis are, number one, the pros is that it mimics real-world choice, real world choices. It looks much more like what respondents do when they're buying products online or when they're buying products at brick-and-mortar stores. You can study hundreds or thousands of product variations within the same survey within typically 200 to 500 respondents, okay? So you can see that you can get a lot more done with CBC than a monadic pricing experiment, for example, or Gabber Granger, which typically would focus on just one or a very few variations of your product. CBC gives insights on price sensitivity. Um, even more than that, than learning about the price sensitivity for your product, you can learn about the price sensitivity of competitors' uh, products, um, cannibalization, what happens if you release two products, how much is it going to take from your product versus competitors? You can see how the what-if simulator from conjoint analysis can give you a lot more insights and answer a lot more business questions than the more isolated and focused pricing techniques, the three other ones that I was mentioning earlier. CBC can also be used for product feature optimization and willingness to pay for individual features like eight-cylinder engine over six-cylinder engine. Okay. The cons are <clears throat> is that it takes respondents longer to complete a CBC survey than these other techniques. It really engages them in, in, a, in, a, in a question that's a little bit more complicated. There's multiple products available. Those products are changing in terms of their features and their price. And what would you choose in each case? Actually, it's a lot more like the brain power that you have to invest in the real world when you're making real world choices. Another thing that's a con for it is it's more complicated for the questionnaire setup and analysis. Now, thankfully, there's very good software out there. Uh, we would, of course, recommend our software for conjoint analysis. We have been doing this for decades. We are the uh, the leader in the world in terms of the features that you can incorporate into your conjoint analysis studies, in terms of the analysis, the flexibility and power of our market simulator. And we are also the market leaders in terms of the technical support crew that stands behind these products and will help you as you have questions. Number three, in terms of cons, is that it just it takes more expertise and training on the side of the researcher to be able to do well with conjoint analysis. Some studies are very straightforward and some studies are not. And so we would recommend, of course, our software and we would recommend the technical support team and our consulting group that stands behind it. If you want to get into this space, if you want to have training, we also have webinars workshops, and conferences where you can learn more. <clears throat> so summarizing things, don't just directly ask people what they would pay. Have them choose among different products at different prices that more looks like what they do in the real world. You cannot emphasize enough how important it is to data clean. When you're using panel sample, there's just the quality is a real issue. Interview people in the market to buy. Use all the standard procedures for identifying bots, speedsters, fraudsters, inconsistent respondents. If you fail to clean the data, no matter which of these four techniques that you're using, you're going to understate price sensitivity and not get a, get a very good answer. The quality of your sample and the quality of your data cleaning may matter more to the value and accuracy of your pricing research than the choice of any of the four methods that we are mentioning today. In summary, which technique should you use? Well, assuming enough respondent time and enough budget for additional questionnaire design and analysis time, we would recommend choice-based conjoint as the best and most comprehensive technique for survey-based pricing research. But if you have limited resources and limited respondent time, the Van Westendorp technique, 
with the Newton Miller Smith extension and the monadic experiments are compromises that are useful for their specific situations. So don't just uh, turn your nose against those and not think about using them. Generally, we're less confident in Gabber Granger. Regarding Satya software, check out our Discover survey and conjoint max diff tool. That's our web-based tool that we're, we've most recently been working on. Very beautiful, intuitive, great tool for conducting surveys and choice-based conjoint and max diff. You can use a free trial at discover.sawtoothsoftware.com and you can field studies with up to 50 respondents with the trial version. Check it out. Also recommend upcoming virtual training on CBC and Max Diff on the Discover platform. If you want to get uh, some training uh, arranged by Aaron Hill, he's gonna be teaching three hours per day virtually starting March 27th through 31st, showing you how to do surveys, choice-based conjoint and Max Diff using the web-based Discover tool, sign up. Thank you very much for listening. And a big thanks to the reviewers and contributors that have helped me out with this presentation over the years and in the last few weeks as I've been preparing this. With that, uh, we'll turn it back over to Miklos to wrap things up. No, I appreciate, thank you, Brian, for, uh, for this great presentation and thank you for the many, many, many questions. I know that we had lots and lots of questions and Aaron and Christine and Keith have done a fantastic job answering. There's certain, certainly we don't have a lot of time to answer all of those. Um, if you have burning questions, please go ahead and, and email us. And we also have a support team. Christina is heading the support team. Um, absolutely fantastic, fantastic um, uh, team. So if we don't answer your question here right now, please uh, be patient. Please reach out to support at satusoftware.com and those people will answer your questions. Um, let me see if there's any questions potentially here that, that may be, but I think Keith and, and Aaron are, are doing a fantastic job. So like I said, if you don't, don't have, um, if you have a burning question, reach out to support at um, Satu Software and, and they will answer your questions. Um, a couple of items of housekeeping um, while, before we break here. Um, number one, uh, so recording. Uh, a couple of people asked about the recordings. Recordings of the presentation will be available, um, usually within 24 hours. So if you registered and you have provided your email address, then we will send you an email with a link where you can access uh, the recordings. Number two, there will be several, uh, several webinars in the upcoming weeks and months. And so please keep an eye out for emails from Sawtooth Software to see the schedule and topics of these webinars, okay? Number three, Brian did mention that we have a new fantastic survey tool with some very strong conjoint analysis and max diff capabilities. And everyone who participated in this webinar can take this tool for a test drive and subscribe to our trial version of it uh, to see the, all the capabilities. The tool is called Discover and you can subscribe free of charge at discover.sawtoothsoftware.com. And I do need to warn you that you will fall in love with it on first sight. So, so please be, be aware of that. And one more thing, uh, Brian mentioned Sawtooth Analytics, which is a group within Sawtooth Software dedicated to helping you if you have a need for some firepower. So don't hesitate to reach out to Sawtooth Analytics if you have um, any questions. Aaron at sawtoothsoftware.com or Keith at sawtoothsoftware.com are the people that you wanna reach out to. And with that, uh, thanks everyone for joining today and I hope to see you all next time.